Hello, everyone. Welcome to We Have Cool Friends, a cool show where we get together with our cool friends and talk about the cool stuff they're doing in their lives. My name is Andy Cortez, and I am joined by ESPN's Mina Kimes. Mina, how are you doing? I'm good. By coming on the show, does that mean we're friends? Or I, is that I, like a- I have such an issue with this introduction, to be honest with you. I, I feel like it's a little presumptive. I don't want to... I don't yeah, want to force this. I don't want to so. force this. Yeah, for sure, for sure. We can, we can. It could be natural. We could play it out. Um, again. Yeah, definitely. Uh, everybody, um, Mina Kimes. Uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. I, I love listening to all of your content. Whether it's you know, I think I first heard of you through the Levitard show, and immediately uh, started following you on Twitter. And then I saw you talking about games and stuff, and I feel like. Whenever there's ESPN people that do that sort of thing, I'm just all in. I'm like, like Pablo, <laughs> there's a lot of people at ESPN that are like, it's not just sports. It's a bunch of other stuff too. So uh, you are a delight wherever you pop awesome. up on an ESPN. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how has this whole transition been for you? Like here, you know, the all this quarantine stuff, obviously you're so used to going to studios and stuff. What's that been like? It's been wild, man. Like... I have an office upstairs and it basically looks like, I was gonna say a radio shack, but I feel like they don't sell any of the stuff. Oh, my dog just jumped off my lap. Okay. Hi Lenny. I wore a polo the other day on um, one of our ESPN shows and everybody was roasting me saying I looked like I worked at a radio shack, which I didn't know radio shack employees wore white or gray polos, but. I'm not sure about the whole attire when it comes to uh, retail. Like, so I worked at Best Buy for six years iconic blue iconic polo. blue polo everybody knows that and nothing worse than going to a staples and being asked excuse me sir do you it's like i the staple <laughs> uh, like what you know what world do we live in and staples is not blue uh, uh-huh, but then i act like i work there anyway because i'm just you know i give in really easily and i'm i guess i'll help you i'm always there, nervous yeah. sure i know where the staples are of course we're in here uh, <laughs> uh yes i mean the same with us here like it's it's been a, a huge transition for us tr- sort of getting used to this i mean you saw me setting thing up and i'm i'm panicking right it's just like i've got to have all these things recording make sure everything's going uh but i think i've i think i've pulled it off and i think it's been a great podcast so far honestly i i agree i could not agree more um so yeah i, I we, we've been doing our tv shows radio podcast which is obviously a lot easier to do from home but uh, the tv stuff has been a transition because that's not just um getting it on the air that's doing our own hair and makeup miking ourselves which sounds like the most first world uh, complaint you could oh my tv job i have to mic myself and do my own hair but um that has been the you know transition in addition just to the normal challenge of going on TV with people and trying to have chemistry when you're not in the same place. Yeah, that's yeah, that's got to be a nightmare. We we uh I have a sort of comedy show that I do with one of the co-founders of the company and it's it's just a lot of like little bits and and st- stupid sure. shit we do. Uh but we found that like we have to edit these because the timing is just not there. There's still silly <laughs> stuff we can't really pull off through a webcam and then Oh, there's audio issues. Somebody's internet kind of screws up. Yeah, it's it's been kind of a nightmare. Like, I can't imagine a corporation like ESPN having to say like, okay, we're a multi-billion-dollar industry, and we have to like. Now we're resorting yeah. to like we can't send tech people out to your houses. You have to figure this out. Yeah, it's been a lot of like FaceTiming, you know, a tangle of wires and asking some guy in Bristol, Connecticut, hey, which one of these looks right? Why is the and audio like, out coming through my, my life. I can't imagine. Yeah. I, well, like, I have faith in you and a lot of the younger people at ESPN because <laughs> I just feel like one thing that I yeah. appreciate about you and I I, um, I texted a buddy of mine who, um, who heard that you were going to be on the show and he was like, dude, this is so awesome. Can you please ask her, like, can you please let her know how how much you just get it like you and and a few other people at espn i I would say like you and pablo are the main ones that just you you feel like you understand uh like current events and memes and twitter and all that sort of stuff and i think that's like so important to relate to people like me who love it all yeah you also picked the only two asians <laughs> so exactly but yeah definitely pigeonholing everybody oh, we're not the only two asians. <laughs> are asians. that's not that's not incorrect but um yeah no i i 
I, I came into sports a little bit later than some people. I've been at ESPN for about six years now, but I was a business journalist for a really long time before I started working at ESPN. I was an investigative reporter. And so sports were just my hobby and my passion. And most of my engagement with uh, football, and this is what led to me being hired at ESPN, was like lurking on weird message boards and such, but also just posting dumb memes. And I love that. I love that side of sports culture now. Um, and I think a lot of athletes do too. So I think it's really important to keep up with it. Yeah, I, I would say easily one of my favorite Twitter followers, honestly, like uh, Twitter follows uh, rather, where I, if, if there's people from our realm, if anybody's watching this that's a kind of funny fan that isn't necessarily super into sports, but sort of like sports adjacent uh, in a way, I would say Mina Kimes and Chase Serrano are my two favorite people to follow on Twitter because of the humor and it's not all sports and sometimes it's a Naruto reference or sometimes it's a tweet about Overwatch or League of Legends and I just it's great it's the pop culture is sort of connects it all I appreciate that man people are gonna think I paid you to have me come on you and give me all these compliments well, you know my Venmo so just you know figure <laughs> that out um I uh I've I've always been wondering what it was like when you first got hired that one who was the first person you interviewed that you was just like, I can't believe that I'm interviewing this person right now. My first cover story at ESPN uh, was on Darrell Revis, who had just gotten paid by the Jets. Revis Island. Uh, I had to do a Stu Gatz there. I'm Island. sorry. What did you say? I had to do a Stu Gatz there. Revis Island. Okay. <laughs> Are you a Jets fan? No, no, I'm a Cowboys fan. I'm a Cowboys fan. Okay. Um, it's very unique. So, it was an assignment and, and like I had all these plans to meet him in New York. His agent told me he was into fashion. So I like set up a meeting with um, like a fashion designer and he didn't show up or he showed up like hours late and we ended up walking all the way down to New York. He was not recognized once uh, and going to like a Japanese restaurant and just shooting the shit for a while. Um, and I just really liked him. He was just a total weirdo. The story was supposed to be about how he had like negotiated all these incredibly advantageous contracts. He's very famous for having made a lot of He's money. He's made a lot of money, yeah. Being sort of a mercenary. Uh, and he was just a very quirky, unusual guy. And it was a really great experience because I think going, getting to write in sports and having been a sports fan, um, it's not like my old job where I was writing about you know hedge funders and stuff and I wasn't I didn't care about yeah. <laughs> wasn't excited it was making you know? money but it wasn't you know the past yeah. there. you know you when you're profiling athletes who you've admired or you are a big fan of what they do um you kind of have to learn to not be a fan anymore sure. and to see them as equals and you know feel like you're on their level because otherwise it'll never work when i think about uh you know interviewing somebody who was super late i had to interview Shaq one time <laughs> and so I'm super nervous, obviously. Like, I, I know I've been a sports fan my whole life. Uh, and it was one of those moments where I didn't want to disturb the the superstar. Like, I didn't want to. I was sure. nervous to just get in the way. You know what I mean? And uh, he was about an hour and a half late. Um, he was doing press a press tour for his new video game that was just coming out. The more recent Shaq Fu, if you all remember. It, it was all over the news. I mean, I'm sure you heard of it. It was... <laughs> Shaq Fu. So Shaq Fu is still happening. Well, so he he re they released a Shaq Fu called The Legend Reborn. And this was about maybe a year and a half, two years ago. Okay. Um, surprised you didn't hear of it. It was It's gigantic game. No, just no one really played it. But it seemed fine. It seemed fine. Yeah, it seemed like a lot better than the prior iteration of Shaq Fu from the 90s. I'll just say that. I, I, it's not... <laughs> There's got to be like problematic stuff in that, right? Like I have oh, not sure. gotten back in the, like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure. I mean, anything in the 90s, I mean, anything. We're in the middle of a sure. review session for a bunch of movies on one of our YouTube channels, and we're watching through a lot of old Kevin Smith movies, and so much of them are like, oh my God, this is like, holy shit, we cannot. Do you ever not want to rewatch something for that reason? Like one of my favorite shows. We're scared of maybe, it. Like, yeah. Five favorite shows is Eastbound and Down. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, which I adore, and I'm almost scared to go rewatch it, even though it's 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 satirical. It's intended sure. to be making fun of these concepts. I'm not sure how much of it would fly right now. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these movies are like there's a lot of homophobic jokes. Like that's kind of like a lot of where the comedy comes from, and it's like ugh, it kind of just makes you wince a little bit. 
Uh, but then well, really quick, just back to Shaq. He ended up being super, super late. Um, and then the two sound guys that were there felt comfortable enough with our sound skills that they were like, hey, you guys got this. We're going to go to lunch. So then Shaq <laughs> gets there and uh, Shaq immediately looks around and is like, all right, I'm ready to go. Who's in charge? Oh, no. And me and my coworker, Kevin, are standing there like a little too, too short, little Latino, like Mexican Peruvian <laughs> kids just sitting there. And we were like, uh, us, uh, we're, we're in charge. And we had set up a chair or we had set up this standing interview where I was going to be standing on a chair. And at the end of it, it zooms out. And I'm going to get off the chair and it's going to look really funny and clumsy. <laughs> and uh, so I, he was sitting in the stair. I was supposed to, in the chair I was supposed to stand on. And uh, he's sitting on it, and we're like, oh, can we get you to stand up, Shaq? He's like, why can't I just sit? And we're like, all right, oh go for it. You sit. <laughs> so it just ruined the whole bit. The whole bit was ruined. But anyway, yeah, I've always been very nervous. Like, I, have you had any experiences like that with athletes where you may have embarrassed yourself? Yeah, a lot of, I mean, I have so many stories I can't even tell. But, um, you know, my very first day at ESPN, uh, my first day – going to the campus in Bristol, which is, it's, it kind of looks like a college campus. And, you know, there's just professional athletes walking around, like who work for us, right? Because oh, former a lot of our analysts are former NBA NFL players. So I'm a rabid Seattle Seahawks fan. As a result, um, you know, I've, I really disliked the Steelers because they cheated us out of a Super Bowl. And um, God, it was, uh, it was Bettis, the bus. So I, I got lost. And I turned around and he was like, excuse me, ma'am, do you need help? And I was like, oh my God, you're Jerome Bettis, which is not what you're supposed to say at all, especially <laughs> if you work there. Because you look like the biggest yeah. jerk. You look like the dude in the Michael uh, documentary asking for an uh, autograph. The French I know, dude, you yeah. want to be that guy. Yeah. So brazen. You want to be like the cool security guy who's just, you know, rolls with it. Yeah. Um, but he was very nice about it. I mean, he's also, you know, like my size, right? Um, which is also weird and surreal when you meet a lot of NFL players like Shaq, there are basketball players. You meet them like you're a, you're a basketball Super tall. player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of NFL players uh, are not that large actually. And that can be, especially when they're done playing like offensive linemen drop their weight. And so it can be kind of surreal when you meet them at first. Interesting. Interesting. Um, let's see. I have a couple of lists of questions I've been writing down. Um, Olive garden right. breadsticks or red lobster cheddar bay biscuits. Red Lobster Cheddar Bay Biscuits and my family, I used to go there on my birthday when I was a kid and my family was like disgusted by it. My mom, who's Korean, was like, this food, this is not good food. I can't believe we're going to Red Lobster. She like scorned it. Uh, but I just loved I love the Cheddar Bay Biscuits so much I that I made that. my family go there. Yeah, Red Lobster was, you know, the place that we went to once a year for the birthdays where like... We, it was a big special occasion. Like <laughs> we're going to Red Lobster after church, and this is going to be a big, huge deal. And you get it once a year. It was always yeah, exciting. Except we didn't have like a ton of money growing up, but Korean families, like my parents, were just not into like American fast care. My mom was just not into like the Sizzler, Red Lobster, any of that. She was like, "This is crap." Got it. So we never got to eat there. I've never been to a Sizzler, but I remember the commercials because I used to chase my brother around and go, the Sizzler, because I just liked the way they said it. it. <laughs> but I never eat there. I don't I don't know what the Sizzler means. I feel even. like it's maybe a, a buffet or like a golden corral. Yeah. I, I have no idea. I, I, nicer, I have yeah. no idea, and I don't want to know, honestly. So if anybody finds out, please don't leave it in the comments. I'd appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, what was the process of you joining the Levitard and Friends Network. Yeah, well, I, it's kind of more like joining the Levitard family in the first place for me. Um, it's sort of what kicked off my inclusion in that and Highly Questionable and everything Dan does. I met him um, at a brunch. My friend who produces all of our shows had a brunch in New York and Dan was in New York, which he never is, who's visiting. And I met him there and within seconds, he was telling me like incredibly detailed story about his dog dying in his arms i was like who is this guy like, i just met him <laughs> we never worked together and he started crying we literally just met um and so I, I i was like i don't know 
I don't know how to process this. But one day I'll be a part of his podcast network. I got a feeling. I guess so. (laughs) Not long after that, uh, the producer of his show asked me if I wanted to come down and host the radio, co-host the radio show with him. This must have been like three years ago, four years ago. Um, And then we just started working together a lot from there. Awesome. That's really, really cool. Um, What went into creating ESPN Daily? Because it's it's a fascinating podcast that wasn't what I expected it to be. I think I think I expected ESPN Daily, which, by the way, you can get on all your podcast places. Every go listen to it. The one from a few days ago was the last one I listened to about the the crazy uh, attempted murder, which is just like nuts. I, I expected ESPN Daily to sort of be here's a wrap up kind of, yeah. uh, so, but it's it's these really interesting stories. Like what went into the creation of that? Yeah, you know, we kind of looked at the daily podcast space. I have a football podcast, but it's weekly. And um, we had a lot of talk podcasts, like similar to my football podcast, kind of more like talk radio or just people sharing their opinions or analysis. And we thought, well, like what, maybe people want something they can listen to every day. But, you know, we felt like doing Sports Center would be sort of redundant um, because you can just go on online and find out, oh, So, uh, yeah, we thought people didn't really want sports in every day. They, you know, wanted to learn something new that they might not get anywhere else. You're not just seeing scores and headlines, which you can get on the app or by watching our network, but hearing writers tell stories that you wouldn't hear other places, um, hearing like in-depth pieces on stuff like chess and, uh, crazy stories like the ones you, you just mentioned. I mean, our, my favorite story we've done is about uh, hockey dentists. Like every hockey team has a dentist. We did a story on that. I loved it. I, <laughs> I just kind of like it. They're only like 20 minutes, right? Yeah. And I have a 1.5 person, so you can kind of blaze through it. I just like the idea of going for a drive or a walk, listening to something, and then having something you can talk to your friends about that they don't know. I don't know. I, I love that that's great. generally. Yeah, yeah. I wanted something around that. And it's easily digestible too. That's when it's it's nice and it's not this two hour long thing. One thing I really appreciate about, about the production is it reminds me of like listening to Serial for the first time. That the, the, the <laughs> way that you narrate, the way the music plays and everything. I think it's like so high end and I, I like I, I guess <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not used to that from anything that's not like, you know, E sixty or anything like that, you know? Yeah. Well, one of our first reviews I remember was like, I really like this podcast. They're like, I listened to this episode and it was about like Russell Westbrooks and how he's no longer taking threes. But I also think he might have murdered someone based on <laughs> <laughs> Russell Westbrook is a point guard from <laughs> yeah, down the musical of it. I love that yeah. stuff. It's really, really good. It's really entertaining. Um Thank you. I was got oh, I had a question. Let me let me see if I need to look at this. Cinderish. Go through like 20 of these a day now. What are they? Spindrift. Spindrift. Sponsor me. Oh, you're asking for a sponsor. I thought you said they sponsored you. Is it just sparkling water? I do not. It's sparkling water. It's so much better than LaCroix, though. Really? So you say LaCroix. I say LaCroix. Um, it's probably LaCroix. I can't. This is a known thing I struggle with. I cannot say French words. So uh, when I first came to college, there was a... ABP is the restaurant abbreviation. Abon Pan. It's like an East Coast thing. Okay. And first time I said it, everyone was like, wait, what? I was like, oh, no, I'm being bullied. (laughs) So I never said it again because I just can't say most French words. And I'm very uncomfortable saying them. So I'll try to avoid saying them. So what I know is that it is, if you are reading that as a French word, it is la croix or whatever. But... When you see the marketing and stuff, they have like, uh, have some joy, drink LaCroix. Or they, they've had marketing stuff like that. So that's how we knew, oh, it's LaCroix. I feel like if you say LaCroix, you deserve to get punched. I, I kind of agree. I kind of agree. I have a LaCroix. It's like when people overly pronounce, pronounce Jesus, um, like foreign words to show off, you know? Oh, God, it's... So, like, my, my co-workers always give me shit because I am Latino and I will always say tortilla. 
And yeah, but you are our Latino. That is, it doesn't apply. True. If you actually, yeah, I guess so. It was understand a, what I'm saying. There was a dude I worked with who we would always go to this Korean restaurant, and he was a white dude, and he would always do the super over enunciated, like, oh bulgogi, like he would like say stuff like that, and we'd be like, dude, stop, like. I feel like this is one of my simps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she knows simp. Oh, it's the best. It's the best. Um, Mina, you often lie about movies that you've watched. Um, That's my jam. And it's one of my favorite things. Um, what's a movie that you haven't seen that you are super embarrassed that you haven't seen? Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Okay. That's a good it's been. It's, it's too late now. It's, I can't watch it. It's too late. That's your brand now. That's your brand. Yeah. Sometimes when you go in too deep, you can't back out. Yeah. Um, you're a huge fan of X-Men. Um, Love it. The animated series. Just the animated series. Just yeah. the animated series. I've actually not seen a lot of the um, films. I'd say like most are. I'd say films. most are pretty bad, and but some are really good. Some are really good. Yeah. If you are going to watch them, watch them like with Fastbender. Fastbender is great. Uh, yeah, Fastbender is great. But uh, what was the latest one that people? Oh, Dark Phoenix. Oh, right. They made, um, which is a bummer because in X Men the animated series. That's like the most riveting part, the, the saga of Dark Phoenix. But apparently, the movie, which is the has the Game of Thrones gal, was terrible. It was not very good. Yeah, and that uh, I think what I think that X Men uh, sort of saga was just trying to do too much of what Marvel did, where it's all everything's tying together, <laughs> but they just don't have yeah. the ma they didn't la they didn't lack the magic, honestly. Uh, but uh, James McAvoy is fantastic. A couple of them are really really good. I would suggest watching them. Who is the best? And worst X Men. The best X Men is Wolverine, no question. Again, I'm solely basing this on X Men the animated series. Of course, of course. Not of my opinions from the modern um, canon. Wolverine was just so funny, man, and sassy. Yeah. Uh, in addition to being like incredibly powerful and like ranking high and you know fighting ability and all of that, and having like my favorite episode is the one where he goes all the way north to fight Sabretooth. That, I forget where, where it's like in Canada or something. I think that's like how the first movie starts, honestly. Oh, really? Yeah, the, the first movie ever made back in like early 2000s with James Marsden and, uh, and yeah, and that crew. James Marsden plays Cyclops, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, Wolverine just has so many incredible one liners, too. Like, he's, oh, he's, Cyclops, I made you a convertible or whatever. Great impression, <laughs> Mina. Great impression. We'll get to impressions later. Yeah. Oh, that's that's okay. definitely in, uh, in one of the friend zone questions. Um, <laughs> uh, and then the worst, everyone knows the worst is Jubilee. It's like, no question. I love Jubilee, but I think it's just the color scheme. I love the color scheme. I love like the bright yellow and fluorescent pink. It's so cool to me. I don't know why. She looks fine, but she was corny as like so, like the annoying teen who's like not actually that helpful. Sure. I, I could see how she'd just sort of be tagging along and just get her out of here. She doesn't belong here. Um,. I love I love a Chris Farley movie. I love a Jim Carrey movie. I love an Adam Sandler movie. Oh yeah, a big Sandler fan. Big Sandler fan. Okay, what is the best Sandler movie that's not Uncut Gems? And by the way, I, I, I haven't seen Uncut Gems, so like that's one of I my th that's either. one that I'm pretty embarrassed by. Yeah. Somebody spoiled it for me. Ah oh, shit. So I now I'm like I'm not gonna see well, it. Well, the Celtics and... won the ring, right? I mean, like that's. <laughs> And my dad's review of Uncut Gems. My dad should have a movie podcast because he has the best takes on movies. His one sentence review of Uncut Gems was nonstop screaming. Why are they screaming so much? Oh, okay. That texted that to me about Uncut Gems. So You should um, create a Twitter account for him. Just like tweets from dad. He's not on any social media. Oh, okay. I I'd go with Happy Gilmore, Billy Madison, close second. That's a, that's a good choice. Great choice. Were you a, a Chris Farley fan at all? Yeah, I think so. Not in the, like, I love the SNL. Like, you know, I, growing up, was, you know, part of the Tommy Boy generation, I'd say. Okay, yeah, because we have a, a huge, there's always a huge debate whenever Chris Farley pops up uh, at the office um, is where I I love Black Sheep and Tommy Boy, and there's a lot of people out there, a lot of naysayers that say Black Sheep is, like, leagues and leagues and leagues below tommy boy i don't think it's as good but i think it's still pretty damn good it's good it's not as good i, I 
Speaking of the two, I mean, I got emotional during the Adam Sandler comedy special oh, when he did the song. Good lord! The whole comedy special was. Phenomenal. It was so good. It's and it was so unexpected because you're like, ah, oh, okay. Well, let's see what you got, Adam Sandler, and it was pretty damn good. I enjoyed yeah. the hell out of that. It was, it was nice because there's really not a lot of um, comedy like that these days that feels so juve like unapologetically juvenile. Yeah, I suppose it had a very vintage feel. Uh, that's not really of this place in time, but was very escapist. Yeah, it was almost comforting in a way. And speaking of comforting, here's a word from our sponsor, MeUndies. Ah, summertime dreaming. These are the days when visions of sunshine and surf dance through our heads. Probably now more than ever as we collectively mold into our couches. But we got to keep the dream alive, everyone. MeUndies is committed to the cause by keeping you in a constant stream of uninterrupted, dream-inducing undie comfort. I've gotten at least three pairs for free through uh, through this uh, sponsorship deal, but then I ended up buying five additional ones because I love them that much. So I, I have now more than a week's worth of MeUndies that I can use. Right now I'm wearing, wearing dinosaurs, everyone. Wearing the dinosaur ones. Love them. Absolutely love them. Uh, Tim also not only has a bunch of underwear, but he's got his shirts, he's got his socks. He's always me undied out, and I'm kind of jealous of him. I feel like he's better than me. How do you reach this uninterrupted state of comfort, you ask? With a membership for me undies. And man, is it handy. Imagine this. Every month, the softest and coziest undies magically appear at your door. As your undie collection grows, your laundry time lessens, and adulting gets that much easier. Plus, a membership comes with side-wide savings, early access, and free shipping. Oh, and zero reasons to ever leave your house. Just grab those new undies off the porch and get right back... That's summertime dreaming. MeUndies are made from micromodal, an irresistibly soft, sustainable fabric that encases your nether regions in a cloud of comfort. It's magically made from trees, another reason to give them a hug. MeUndies are offered in a range of sizes from extra small to 4XL. MeUndies has a great offer for my listeners. For any first-time purchasers, you get 15% off and free shipping. You gotta give this super softness a try, especially because they have a 100% satisfaction guaranteed. We all love MeUndies at the office. To get 15% off your first order, free shipping, and 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash morning. That's MeUndies.com slash morning. To get 15% off your first order, free shipping, and 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash morning. Back to the show. Ba Andy, back to you. Back to you and Mina Kimes, Andy. Mina, you've been, you've been big into binge watching. Uh, throughout all this break. I've heard you talk about it on your podcasts before. But for our viewers out there, what do you recommend to watch right now throughout this whole sort of crazy quarantine ordeal? I'll give two recommendations of shows I've loved. I've watched a lot of shows, but these are the ones that I loved. Halt and Catch Fire, watched all four seasons. Amazing. Season one, kind of a Mad Men knockoff. You got to get through it. They're sort of working through some things. Season two, they realize that the women are the star of the show and it becomes incredible from there. I mean, seasons two, three, and four are honestly some of the best television seasons of television I've ever seen. Um, I cannot remember the last time I cared about characters the way I did watching that show. The music is phenomenal. It's very period. It's 80s and 90s. Oh, for the, I should have said what the show's about. It's about the advent of like the personal computing industry and the internet and it goes through. And, and you know, if you're into tech, some of it is a little bit sloppy and, you know, they, they sort of, it centers around four um, actors and actresses and they kind of discover everything yeah. <laughs> along the way. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really, it's about, it's about like the also brands of tech, and it, which is fascinating conceptually, like, you know, what we want out of our work. It's about four people who are incredibly passionate about their work. And that's something I don't think you see depicted a lot on television where the job is the thing. Um, where the, the creative process is the thing and the point, and it's really inspiring and just beautifully made. And they and, hate each other and then love each other and then hate each other and love it. It's a great show. I love Halt and Catch Fire. Your allegiances change. Yeah. Like you're like, I love this character. Now I hate them. I love this character. I mean, it's just amazing. And by the end, you, you feel like you know they're your family. So phenomenal show. Uh, the other show I just watched that I loved is Dave on FX, which um, 
inadvertently led to me beefing with the rapper Lil Dicky. Oh, yes. We need to hear about this. Yeah. <laughs> whose work I was not, I had kind of heard of Freaky Friday and I saw it and I was like, Chris Brown, eh, no thanks. Um, and then I watched the show and I'd seen the advertising. I was like, I'm not watching that. Uh, but our friend's girlfriend's in the show. So I, I watched it and I was like, this is the, I mean, I was rolling laughing. It's just so funny. The performances are great. He really lets the other characters breathe. Um, and so after the sh I finished the show, I tweeted, just watched the show. Dave loved it. Then I looked up Lil Dicky's music and I'm having a little cognitive dissonance. Um, this actually, so then his fans, hundreds of them just start coming for me the davers the dickheads oh dickheads sure okay i didn't know yeah. what they i didn't even know they had a thing yeah. my bad so which i first of all my tweet was not even that mean yeah to be honest but whatever and um i realized that it my the the it was a bit of a self own because it appears that the uh, venn diagram of mina kimes fans and little dicky fans is, oh uh, boy circle so <laughs> it says more about me than <laughs> uh, so uh i think we buried the hatchet i'm never gonna i'm never he, he's on my list of uh people i'm that fan base is terrifying and i cover sports yeah like, i know terrifying fan bases but they are passionate they yeah i saw them sort of coming at you and it was it was pretty entertaining to watch i i, I agree with you like the show really caught me off guard and it, i didn't start watching until everybody at work and a lot of people on twitter started saying you need everybody if you're a fan of curb your enthusiasm this is something you have to watch and i love curb i love larry david and it has a lot of that sort of awkward humor that i'm just a big fan of uh but then it gets so real and and the writing gets and i'm crying and then like it's just it's a roller coaster it's really really well done um, and also, I do want to say Halt and Catch Fire, easily like top five theme songs. Oh, yeah. Top five intros. Like, good Lord. Right up there with the X-Men, the animated okay. show, which yeah. they're so close to each other. Yeah, they're so close to each other. Um, let's see here. Uh, so we t mentioned earlier that you're super great on Twitter and you're an awesome follower. What do you think is the most what do you think is the most overused GIF on Twitter? Hmm. Oh, I know what it is. I hate it when people send this to me. Ashton Kutcher in that 70s show leaning in saying burn. burn yeah. God. Like, this is not, I, often it's when I'm not even trying to burn someone. So I'm, I'm like, you misread the intention of my quote tweet. You know? As soon as you said Ashton Kutcher, that's the first thing I thought of. Um, that's definitely a good call. That's a good call. I would go with... Uh, I would go with Jonah Hill doing this, the exciting thing. Like, I'm excited. Oh, yeah. Yeah, as soon as you, it's like the first reaction whenever you type in excited. Um, yeah. Mina, I'm a huge fan of your paintings. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I think it's so cool when anybody is able to show a different side of themselves. Um, and that, I, I it caught me off guard because I know that you had done some Etch-A-Sketch stuff, which is really crazy. Like, I don't know how to even <laughs> like process how one would make art on, a, on an Etch-A-Sketch. But then you started doing these watercolors. And there was the great Philip Rivers one. Uh, what, what sort of like, have you always been drawing? Is this just something that maybe you kind of put away for a while and now you're back to it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've always enjoyed drawing. I'm not great at it. It's just kind of a hobby. And I find it's kind of nice to have a hobby that you don't feel pressure to be great at, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then um, I just started kind of doing in the moment paintings in response to stuff happening in sports memes that I liked the big baby. And, uh, yeah. The big baby, the large baby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not actually a baby stolen baby valor, but, um, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. What? Hey, you don't know this. The big baby is a toddler. The big baby was never a baby. So the big baby was like a, a four year old head. was like a three or four year old or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a toddler with a shaved head. Oh, that's bullshit. Oh, my God. I just, but I kind of respect it. Just wrecks the lore. <laughs> just wrecks the lore for me. Oh, my God. We had to cut a whole segment of Highly Questionable about the big baby because we were like, did we all just spend four minutes roasting a baby we on did. the internet? Yeah, and it was... We probably can't air that on ESPN. 
Um, it was great, though. I mean, like, <laughs> like the fact that Twitter just sort of unified and there was world peace for one second just to shit on this baby. Yeah. yeah. It's great when that happens. Um, but yeah, the uh, paintings, and then I just kind of figured people wanted them. So I started auctioning them off for uh, uh, homeless services nonprofit here. And then more recently for some coronavirus relief stuff. Um, so I just mailed off all my paintings. So I don't have any in the house right that's now. That's awesome. Well, that's very, very cool. That's very nice of you. We appreciate that sort of uh, service. And I, I also appreciate uh, how how active you are when it comes to like social causes and stuff. I, I love that. I love seeing that from people that I respect. I think it's important that we uh, that we speak out. And every once, every once in a while, I'll do it and I'll get some backlash. But it's like, hey, I may have a little tiny platform, but it's still a platform. And I need to like sort of speak up whenever I, I feel like I can or whatever. Um I'm not making a I'm not making an art request here, Mina. Okay. Sounds like you're about to. In the future, if you're ever making another auction art piece, and it's something that I'll likely buy, um, just a little recommendation, Mina. A little little reco. What is the, the uh, <laughs> Ginobili blocking Harden from behind? <laughs> I think you might get some competition for that image, actually. Shit. Oh, you're right. You're right. damn it. Are you from San Antonio? Uh, I I grew up like on the border as far south as you can go, like right on the border in the in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, McAllen, Texas. But I always grew I grew up a Spurs fan, Cowboys fan for that's a big football town right there. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, uh, grew up a Cowboys fan and a Braves fan, which is uh, why are you a Braves fan, Andy? You're from Texas, but they were on TBS. They were the only you know nationally syndicated uh, baseball team. That's how everybody became fans, really. Um, I think it's time that we all hop into the friend zone, everybody. Uh, these are questions that were submitted from uh, Patreon Patreon members at some level. I, <laughs> Mina, you're my first like real interview that isn't like Shaq or me on another in a group <laughs> panel interview. You know what I mean? So like right. when it comes to the whole rigmarole and spiel about what we normally do on this show, I'm always kind of lost. But you have to be a member at a certain level uh, to ask a question. Um, so I have some questions here. Um, Antman020208 asks, Hi, Mina, big fan of yours. If you could pick which team should get a 10-part Last Dance documentary, which team would you pick? And why is the correct answer the 90s Dallas Cowboys? <laughs> that is actually an excellent answer. Um, I will choose a different answer just to get come up with something else. Um, I would, I think a really fascinating series would be on the San Francisco 49ers during the Colin Kaepernick years, mm. um, beginning with when he took over a quarterback. So before he became an activist, uh, beginning with the football stuff. So people can remember how freaking good he was, but also uh, talking about, you know, the dissolution of that incredible defense, because it's really remarkable. Um, so many players retired so quickly or like Chris Borland quit because of, uh, concussion, concussion yeah. and, um, it was a really fascinating alden smith all, everything that happened with him it, it all happened really quickly at the same time that this colin kaepernick uh, you know his activism began in 2016 and sort of the end of that and then um sort of the split between trent balky was the gm and john harbaugh the chip kelly year I, I just think there's so much fascinating material both from a football perspective and just behind the uh, scenes issues perspective with Colin Kaepernick. So I, I would love to watch that. I would definitely watch that as well. That's a great choice. Um, Glenn Martin says, Mina, you did a great job in the Rams booth pre in the Rams booth during the preseason last year. Will we see you during color commentary again this year? And now that you have done it for one season, holy shit, the question cuts off Mina. Oh no, here we go. Here we go. I'm able to edit now. <laughs> It's a stupid Excel, like Google Sheets thing. And now that you've able to, been able to do it for one season, has this become part of your career? This question never ends. Oh, my God. How long is this? Hold on. <laughs> By the way, I like that you're um, reading these for the first time and reading the usernames because there was a period where some of my listeners to my football podcast were leaving usernames like from like adult websites. So I would read them out loud and not know what they oh, were. No. And then my guest would be like, um, Lena, that, um, <laughs> you don't understand. You don't want to be the guy who's like, 
well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. I have the rest of this question. It's, it's, I don't understand Excel or anything like that. Um, okay. I think I know where this question is So, uh, yeah. Has this become a part of your career that you're excited about and committed to pursue? Or did they already give you the Monday Night Football gig and you just can't tell us yet? You're amazing. And it seems to be more, but I'll leave it at you're amazing. Okay. Thank you, Glenn Martin. Um, and just maybe, you, like, Martin. add some brackets or maybe, like, you know. Anyway, that's a more of a question. Getting a lot of information in yeah. there. Um, I, I, I don't, I will not be in the Monday Night Football booth, um, but I, I will be back. I very likely doing um, preseason commentary, assuming there is a preseason. Uh, and it is not my main aspiration, but it is certainly something I enjoy doing, and I've been learning a lot about. Awesome. And really challenging. I'll say that it's probably the most challenging thing I've done uh, since coming to ESPN. Fantastic. Um, I have a question from you that I'll submit here from uh, here's a username Andy Cortez. Um, you got really uh, I think one one time that I noticed uh, and, and got interested in you as a ESPN personality is I saw you tweet about Overwatch. Are you an active gamer? Have you been in the past? Have you sort of let that hobby go? Um, so I'm not so I I pretty much peaked in, you know, playing Tetris in elementary school and junior high. I was very good at Tetris. And then watching my brother play GoldenEye and Rogue Spear and getting to play 10 minutes for every 50 minutes he played. The original eSport is little sisters watching their older brothers and not getting to play. Yeah, with the um, controller unplugged, yeah. <laughs> but um, I've written a couple three no two esports pieces for espn that has fueled my interest in gaming generally and in the same way that i would be interested in really any sport as a fan observer um, my first piece was in 2015 god uh, and it was our first big esports piece at espn actually we didn't have an esports vertical back then uh, but the magazine asked me to write anything they said you have carte blanche write about anything. And I ended up writing about a League of Legends player in Korea named Faker. Um, the process for slicing that was pretty easy. I just asked what's the most popular game and who's the best player. Yeah. <laughs> and I went to Korea and I, and I wrote about him. But more broadly, I think about sort of, I was very interested in the idea of, okay, why are Koreans so dominant at this? Um, Cause you know, we're not born with a gaming gene. So uh, there was fascinating cultural, socioeconomic, historical reasons that I, that's as a journalist, you love solving those yeah. kinds of mysteries. And also I was, I wanted to learn who is this 19 year old kid at the time and what makes him so good. So that was my first story. And then a couple of years later, I did another story on a, um, another Korean gamer, an Overwatch. Gigori. Pro. Named Gigori, yeah. yeah. So that was another one where I went to Korea to write about her. And that story was, the story was already obvious because at the time, um, you know, it wasn't obviously covered a lot in the U.S., but she had been accused of cheating because she was a woman, mm -hmm. really. Um, and I wanted to kind of figure out what was happening around that and who she was. So I got to go to Korea and write about it again. And I learned a lot about Overwatch in that process. And um, yeah, so it just kind of fueled my interest. I I don't play, but I like to sort of stay abreast of what's happening with both of those games, you know, and who the major players are. I have friends who are much more involved in it than I am. And That's I awesome. just find it really fascinating. I don't know. I just, it, being a journalist, having started as a more of a reporter, now I'm an analyst, your job is just to be a curious person. Sure, yeah, and yeah. If you are hearing about something happening that a lot of people are passionate about and your reaction is, that's not sports, what are you doing? Your reaction should be, that's fascinating. I want to figure out why they're curious about it, what gets them excited about it. And the answers to that have always been really compelling to me. I love that. I love that. Um, I have a question here from... Matt Batts, and he had a question about X-Men. I already asked you who your favorite X-Men was. and uh, But his second question is, would you, rather be, would you rather be able to communicate telepathically with Lenny or be able to turn Lenny into a car-sized rideable dog at will? Communicate telepathically. Where would I put him <laughs> if he was gigantic? No, I think, I, already... I think it's at will. I think it's like, you know, I got to go to the grocery store. Let me just, and then, you know, a little transformation process. 
I, I'm just such a realist when it comes to these questions. Like when people are like, would you rather be invisible or fly? I'm like, in what universe could I fly and not be investigated by the government and sure. like turn into a sideshow? <laughs> yeah. So that's how I feel about Lenny becoming supersized. People, you know, the zoo would come after us. Yeah. I don't know. So Scientists I'd rather would have try to capture him to figure out what he's got. Yeah. We're X-Men fans. We know what happens to mutants. Yeah, so absolutely. I'd rather have the telepathic thing, which I could, you know, have be a private thing. Um, I have a question here. Mina, have you been uh, keeping active during the quarantine? I've been having trouble and struggling with working out, and I was wondering if anybody else can relate to that. I definitely can relate to that. I'm very fortunate in that I bought a treadmill right before all this stuff happened, which has been such a blessing. Um, and I got an iPad for the first time. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, so did I. Like I, I got, was really late. Yeah, yeah, so did I, yeah. So I've been I've been exercising while watching Too Hot to Handle on Netflix. Oh, God, yeah, my coworkers have been talking a lot about that show. Yeah. Really dumb. I, I, I like to watch dumb stuff while I exercise because you can kind of... Yeah, you just turn, the, turn the brain off, yeah. Uh, Lexi Gunner asks a question. Hi, Mina. I love your impressionations of celebrities. Do you have a favorite? I don't know if I impersonate celebrities so much as accents and voices, and they're all terrible. I think they're great. I think th I think we're very similar in, in how we get a lot of backlash for our impersonations. And I, 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 you, this is my first interaction. You sent me your Snape impersonation. I'm like, this is gold. Thank you. I know. Snape with me right now. Oh my god! Finally, chill. Jesus. Uh, I I. <laughs> I got a great tweet a reply from when I said that I was going to be interviewing you and it was a character that I kind of forgot existed of yours, uh, but it was the witch. Witch, yeah. <laughs> and... Probably the most hated character in the history of the Levitard <laughs> show. So I'll do, I'll do that for the people. Perfect. So the Levitard show has this bit where everyone pretends like they're in a medieval court. Real thing that happens on ESPN. And um, <laughs> I wanted to be a part of it because I'm always, I just like love it. Yeah. So I'm such a fan of the bit. Yeah. But the, so I can't do like an old timey, like, ee, oh, well, I'm a princess voice. Yeah. But the only voice I could come up with was being the town witch who's trying to eat King Roy's baby. Mm -hmm. But every time I would come on, people, I, I think people actually liked it, but they made a show of not liking it. I think we like it because it's not very good. I think it's a divisive character. Yeah, I think because you break break character and laugh along with it, like I I have just in my car dying. Yeah, I'm the Stefan, I suppose, of uh, of King exactly. Roy's Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like this. Roy, where's your baby, Princess Claire? It's so good. It's so good. I just closed my eyes and I was like, yeah, I'm listening to the show. That's great. I love and, that. And you saw me. I can't do it without like bending over. Oh, you have to do a hunch. Uh, very method. Very method of you. Um, that's about all I've got. This was fun. I'm glad you joined this podcast, Mina. Um, where can everybody find you, Mina Kimes? I'm on Twitter at Mina Kimes. Please subscribe to ESPN Daily wherever you get your podcasts. If you're into football, the Mina Kimes show featuring Lenny is my football show. Otherwise, you can uh, see me on ESPN. Everybody follow her on Twitter. She's a fantastic person to follow. Uh, I had a blast. Thank you once again for joining me. Uh, everybody make sure you click that like button and you subscribe here on YouTube.com. Sounds kind of funny. We love you all. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful, safe rest of your day.